Buddha Center in Second Life, and today we have Neo joining us, um, listening to the talk, and uh, it's just like uh, we're two people listening to the same talk, uh, because I haven't actually read this uh, before, and um, yeah, we're just going to be picking up, and I think this is going to be um, probably the fifth or the sixth. Video part of this uh, study. So, uh, yeah. And before we start reading, we're just gonna pay homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the Rightly Self Awakened One. Okay. And we're still studying the text or the talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. Um, so let me just remind myself where where this was given. Um, okay, so and it's the talk on the Arya Vasa, and we'll be continuing with the chapter of purity of mind where we just left off the last time going through some of the hindrances to insight and continuing on oh and Neil just let me know if you want to uh, do some reading uh, as well you can just uh, put it in the chat and we can just switch over if you have a mic that would be cool so but let me just uh, start by reading the first part here Purity of mind. There is still much to be said about the hindrances, ni niwarana, to enlightenment. In short, the yogi should note the five hindrances when they arise and eliminate them. To overcome all of them, he should first try to attain purity of mind, citta visuti. The Nirvanas are barriers to mental culture, for good and evil thoughts cannot occur together with the uh, at the same time. So the yogi's states of consciousness are pure and wholesome when he is unmind when he is mindful. Hindrances have their uh, hindrances have their origin in unmindfulness that give that gives rise to sensual desire, ill will, sloth, restlessness, anxiety, and doubt. The unmindful man gives them free rein, thereby making his mind impure. How can he keep his mind pure when he is continually harassed by one of them even during his meditation? This vulnerability to hindrances is quite familiar to some people who have practiced meditation. Many people do not meditate because they count on their acts of almsgiving, observance of moral precepts, recitation of scriptures and devotional services for mental and moral purity. They do not meditate, they say, since they never do evil, bear ill will, and let their minds uh, be defiled. Nevertheless, they are quickly disillusioned when they take up meditation. Okay, Neo, and just let me know if you want to take a, a lump of reading. Uh, continuing on. I remember the experiences of a woman who once practiced mindfulness under my guidance. I gave her the usual instructions, uh, i.e., to note every sense impression, beginning with the rising and falling of the belly. Shortly thereafter, she complained of her mental distractions. She said that at home her mind did not give her any trouble that since the day she started meditating she had had uh, much trouble coping with, with its impurities. 
Of course, she did not know the nature of consciousness. At home, she was unaware of impure or... Oh, I'm sorry. At home, she was unaware of pure or impure thoughts because of her unmindfulness. She harbored the delusion that her mind was pure, but in reality, she had no idea of about its moral character. Consider, for example, a piece of cloth used in the kitchen and stained with all kinds of dirt. It does not take... Oh, I'm sorry. It does not make any difference if we soil it any further. Similarly, the ordinary man defiled with inner impurities is unconscious of their impact on him. For as an for as an absent-minded man, he is not trying to make his mind pure. It is only mindful introspection that makes us immediately conscious of ill will, sensual desire, frustration, and so forth, that otherwise would, ha would have escaped our attention. Awareness of one's defilements is then no less palpable than that of a stain on a lily-white handkerchief. Gold is always attractive by itself, but it reveals its true quality only when tested by means of a touchstone. Likewise, our inner impurities come to light only in meditation, and as every yogi knows from experience, it is only through mindfulness that we can effectively purge ourselves of these impurities. For the stream of consciousness is always clear in a mindful person who is immune to all kinds of mental impurity. This state of pure consciousness is called Chitta Visuddhi in Pali. Some people who do not know its nature believe that it is accessible only to the jhanic, entranced yogis. But this jhana, but this jhana-induced mental purity rests on the uninterrupted duration of jhanic trance, whereas the other kind of mental purity is born of insight knowledge, vipassana jhana. Uh, both step. Both states of pure consciousness are devoid of hindrances. Okay, so these are jhanas, are the based of what we know as concentration or insights. Okay, and so uh, the next chapter or the next part of the text is on the distinction between mind and body. And let me just see, we are... Okay, so we're only eight minutes into the talk. And let me just uh, qualify that by... If you have to go anywhere, Neo, uh, you can just get up and you can uh, catch up with the recording. But I'm probably going to be reading on for at least uh, half an hour um, but yeah uh, very happy to have you here okay um, going back here to the text and okay let me just see oh you're in this oh I missed it it's because you're in the nearby chat Neo. same as Samadhi Okay, okay, so now I'm at least in the right chat. Okay, continuing on here. Distinction between mind and body. The state of pure consciousness enables the yogi to distinguish between mind and body. Um, let me just put this line here. Now, a few words about the distinction between nama consciousness and rupa, corporeality, um, or form. Um, 
whether some people like it or dislike it. We will begin with the rising and falling of the belly. Many people disliked it at first, but when on the advice of their friends oh, but when they on the advice of their friends they tried it, uh, they found our method quite satisfying. So so much so that e uh, they even blamed those whose criticism has mislead misled them before. Okay. So yeah, this is definitely a technique uh, which is praiseworthy and completely <laughs> blameless. Uh, indeed, we can understand how that could happen. I'm sorry. Continuing with the text, the Satipatthana way to mindfulness certainly appeals to those who have seriously followed it, because it brings them into contact with ultimate reality. Paramatta Dhamma in Pali. Just as we know uh, the heat of fire, the sweetness of sugar, etc., from experience, so also we can know the truth or otherwise of a doctrine, uh, not on hearsay, but only through empirical investigation. In fact, when we tell the yogi to focus on the rising and falling of the belly, our instruction is, in essence, the Buddha's teaching. The rising indicates the vayu, or the wind element, and, it, and its characteristic is instability. In the contemplation of mind and matter, the yogi should not bother about the number size, shape, or designation of the object of his attention. Some people seek to focus on what they believe to be the shape of, an atomic, of atomic particles, but shape is linked only with color and tactical sensation, and it is not to be found in any other element of psychophysical Nama-rupa complex. And so, um, just uh, commenting on this last line, um, it's talking to direct experience, ultimate reality as we know it, um, as meditators, versus um, what is not actually a part of reality. Okay, continuing on. Again, how can it be possible for the yogi to observe sound, smell, or taste atomically? Even if material objects may lend themselves to atomic analysis, the same cannot be said of mind and its elements such as greed, anger, etc. This has escaped the notice of some people who view the who views why uh, the wind element uh, in Pali why with a V not a W uh, as dissolving atoms. In fact, we should focus on the nature of a phenomenon only in terms of its characteristics, etc. For instance, we become aware of the wind element when we focus on the rising and falling of the belly. And then, how are we to understand the wind element? The characteristics of the wind element are instability, tenseness, or tightness and looseness. These are relative terms depending on the comparison of the object with others. For example, of the three ropes stretched side by side, the first one may be, uh, may be taut or loose compared with the other two ropes. When the yogi focuses on the rising and falling of the belly, 
he does not at first notice the wind element nor the consciousness uh, nor the oh let me just he, he does not at first notice the wind element nor the let me just make sure I'm not jumping in the text okay I guess I have to zoom a little bit just a second So, when the yogi focuses on the rising and falling of the belly, he does not at first notice the wind element, nor the distinction between mind and matter. In the beginning, he needs to note and overcome the hindrances. Only when hindrances erode, leaving the consciousness pure, does he become clearly aware of tenseness and instability, inclining, bending, leaning, moving, walking, etc. all convey the same meaning, viz. Um, motion which is the function, uh, rasa, of the wind element, the vayudatu. Vayu means wind which moves from one place to another when it is strong. At other times it remains quiet and tense. This function of wind, this function of the wind element is familiar to the yogi who contemplates the rising and falling of the belly. He is quite aware of the gradual movement outward uh, during the rising and inward during the falling. The resulting phenomenon, uh, Pachupatana, of the wind element is its propulsion in the direction determined by its tendency. In case of voluntary actions such as bending or stretching the hand, the direction depends on the inclination of the mind. In bending and stretching, there is the inward and outward propulsion. In walking, you feel being pulled forward or backward. This kind of feeling is apparent too in the rising and falling. It is, in fact, the resulting phenomenon of the wind element in the form of earnest in the form of earnest wish or tendency Apinihara Pachupatana um, So yeah I was just thinking to add a comment um, on how because this is so awesome and we just heard about how it is that the technique of noting the rising and falling um, at first does not make cl uh, qu quite clear how or why uh, understanding comes about from uh, using uh, this technique but the thing is that we are for the most part of our daily lives too busy to actually note um, the qualities of our mind states because we're too busy focusing, as the, the Venerable Mahasi Saira said, uh, we're too busy focusing and fixating on the objects of our attention rather than how we relate to them with uh, disliking, aversion, or desire, and all these other qualities. Um, and so, here, we're just catching up how we're actually going to be studying into how uh, we can realize the difference between uh, Nama and Rupa, usually known as body and mind, or naming and forming. And so, just with a little catch up here, let's just uh, continue with the text. And let me just see the chat. Hi, 
Sorry, earlier on the person did you come in for a talk? Okay, I think we're gonna have to wait. I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. Continuing in the text. The resulting phenomenon is any impression that occurs to the mind when we think of something. Thus, when the yogi notes the rising and falling of the belly, he sees the wind element behind it in terms of its characteristic, function and resulting phenomena. At the same time, there may arise unpleasant sensations like heat, cramp, pain in the body, etc. In this connection, the Buddha says, the monk is aware of disagreeable feelings even as he experiences them. Here, experience as a verb is the translation of the Pali word Vedayami in the text and uh, its grammatical uh, construction of the Pali word Vedayami in the text and its grammatical construction implies I the first person, uh, singular, as the subject, just like Kachami, I walk. Um, okay, so let me just see here. Experience. I experience. Okay. Kachami. Kachami. If this were to be. If this were to be dismissed as mistranslation, it would be like the dis the desecration of the Buddha's teaching. Okay, so the uh, <laughs> the lesson on grammar here, which is indeed very important, is that when we say um, "I experience." It is uh, not important that there is an I. It is from the viewpoint of the first person in singular. So, Kachamiti, uh, say I, or when we say I go to the re uh, Buddha for refuge, um, we say I go, and in translating uh, from Pali, um, going to the use of going in Pali would be I go in one word I guess and so uh, that's what the explanation here actually is ok so let's see if we're going to hear more comment on this reading on me and my people do not say I experience heat instead they say it is hot so our yogi is instructed to make a mental note of the, spe of the specific sensation that he has. It is hot, it is cold, it is painful, and so forth. The unpleasant feeling has the characteristic of pain or, su or suffering. Its function is to depress the spirit as is evident in sickness and its resulting phenomenon is irritating sensation in the body um, starting from experiencing heat as a fever uh, for example thus the yogi understands unpleasant feelings in terms of its characteristic function and resulting phenomenon The same way may be said of pleasant or indifferent feelings. There is no need to memorize the three aspects for they become quite clear to the yogi as he keeps on noting the rising and falling. Okay. That's interesting. Grammatically, 
but it is, I mean, this is so important. So I'm just going to read this again for myself. Me and my people do not say, I experience heat, it's just say, it is hot. And whereas in Pali, which is the language of the Buddha, Gotama, they would say, I experience heat, as in Kachami. Yes, Neo, as you were saying in the chat, so just Vedana. So that would be like uh, when me and my people feel joy, they don't say, "Oh, I'm so or happy." They don't say, "I'm I'm happy" or "I feel happy." Uh, they just say, maybe they say, "Happiness has arisen." I mean, I don't know how to. They, they wouldn't actually even consider uh, the concept of an I experiencing. They just go directly into experience. That's interesting. Um, so, uh, talking about the study of language that uh, they don't actually bend over the eye or whatever so okay the more you know right in Danish I'm from Denmark so we say if it is hot outside it's we say it's we just complain and say it's too hot so we're both, both judging it and uh, we say it's too hot outside something like Anyway, it's getting very technical, which is also why these talks are so awesome. And so, yeah, and and in I mean, if you're using or if you're familiar uh, to with this technique, um, and maybe your English is not your first language, you would also note or uh, come to uh, see for yourself how um, this the Dhamma is actually alive because it just crosses boundaries in, I mean language boundaries in that way um, since you have to uh, kind of apply it to your own understanding right so you can't just say oh uh, we can uh, we can just write the Dhamma down on a piece of paper and anybody could come and check if it is right or wrong because uh, that's just one way it is right but it's, it's not like that. The Dhamma is dynamic and it's alive and uh, you can't actually you know make it uh, something which it isn't. So it's interesting how it uh, crosses these boundaries seemingly easy for ardent meditators. Okay and the next chapter here is the nature of consciousness and we're just about a half an hour in um, the nature of consciousness I just think that's something that is so important and interesting that it would be hard to actually not if not end with that um, then definitely read it right now and then maybe end off at insight and knowledge of impermanence for next time Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. And um, yeah, it's not too long. So let's continue on in the text. And Neo, let me just ask you if you have any questions or comments. I, I see you in the chat there. Um, and um, you're good. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, th you, you don't actually. Uh, one thing I noticed reading these talks is that I don't actually need to explain anything because, of course, the talks themselves are so in depth. So sometimes I just have to explain things to myself so I actually can understand what it is I am <laughs> uh, looking at here. So that's nice. But okay, you're good, Neil, and I think we should just continue then the nature of consciousness it is the characteristic of consciousness to know its sense objects hence there are different kinds of consciousness depending on different kinds of contact seeing hearing smelling etc all through the six senses with different sense objects sound odor taste etc the function of consciousness is to lead its 
concomitants. Delete its concomitants. Okay, so I don't actually know the word concomitant, but I would imagine that it is something like, you know, the little fishes following the whale. Concomitant. So as consciousness leads, accompanying especially from a subordinate or incidental way. Okay, so it is we're talking about something accompanying consciousness. Concrete, solid. Oh. Okay, so it's an accompanying quality of the state. That's interesting. Okay. The function of consciousness is to lead its concomitants uh, as the keystone of man's mental life. It takes the initiative and is followed by greed, hatred, faith, mindfulness, or other mental factors. Yeah, so that was my idea as well, like you have consciousness and with consciousness birth births these other um, following uh, qualities or aspects of uh, the leading factor which is consciousness. And so, because as a result of consciousness there arises desire for more consciousness, etc. The resulting phenomenon of consciousness is its apparent connection with the preceding mental state. The meditating yogi notes one state of consciousness and watches it disappear after giving rise to another mental state. Thus, the state of flux characteristic of consciousness is crystal clear to the yogi. Uh, a state involving the ceaseless arising and passing away of mental units. Just as in the case of the wind element, the yogi can contemplate other psychophysical phenomena, each with reference to its three aspects, viz. Now you do know what, how to actually pronounce this uh, V-I-C, viz. I mean, it is something like, uh, what is that a short of? I, I don't know, I just usually say this and, and hope that it's alright. Okay, so, uh, each with reference to its three, three aspects, this characteristic function and resulting phenomenon. Here, we will briefly consider the distinction between consciousness and corporeality. Mind and body. Namarupa. Mindfulness at the moment of seeing an object depends on eye and color, which are corporal or physical, while seeing and knowing are mental. The same way the same may be said of the ear together with the sound corporal and awareness of hearing mental at the moment of smelling something we have the nose and odor as corporal as rupa and consciousness of smell as mental nama ear and sound no ear and sound nose and odor tongue and taste body and contact their pairs of physical phenomena have their corresponding mental phenomena of eye consciousness chakku vijnana sound consciousness scent consciousness and touch cons consciousness the scope of touch consciousness is very wide it arises in every part of the body and is linked with bending, stretching, moving, 
or of walking. So, when the yogi is mindful at the moment of bending his hand, his, I th the, his hand, I think it's supposed to say, uh, the, the bending is corporal and the awareness is mental. The stretching of the hand causing tenseness and movement is corporal while no while the knowing is mental. Uh, the rising and the, f the rising and falling of the belly too indicates the two aspects of life, um, namely mind and matter. In taking a step, the feeling of lightness as the yogi raises his foot indicates tejo, heat, the heat element. Uh, tejo datu. Tenseness and motion as he puts the foot forward to point to the vayu, uh, wind elements. The heaviness as he puts down the foot is the apo element. While the friction and resistance arising from the impact of the foot on the ground is the patawi or the earth element and so apo element is the water element if I remem remember correctly and we don't directly experience it um, but here we have the example of heaviness um, of the water element uh, and thus the distinctive features of each of the four primary ele elements are evident Whenever the yogi observes the behavior of his body, he distinguishes between the corporal corporeality, which does not know the sense object, rupa, or the, the form, and the mind, which knows it. So, just adding a comment, we have rupa, the form, which knows nothing. It's just like a stone. And then when mind joins with rupa, or observes Rupa through consciousness, there is the knowing of the Rupa. So Rupa never knows anything, only Nama. Okay. The Buddha compared the consciousness to the string attached to a diamond. Just as a man with clear eyesight sees the string clearly apart from the, from the diamond, so also the yogi differentiates uh, definitely the consciousness from corporeality. The string attached to a diamond. Okay. Later on, as concentration develops, the yogi becomes aware of the distinction between cause and effect in the process of mindfulness. In the beginning it takes some effort to note the bending or stretching of the hand. In due course he learns to note the desire to stretch or bend. Thus he becomes aware of the fact that it is this desire that leads to bending or stretching, that there is no one no person who causes them, but only cause and effect. When we do the bending and stretching, we do not notice the desire to do so, because we do not have the habit of mindfulness and concentration. The yogi who has acquired this habit is aware of it spontaneously. It is only a matter of a few days steadfast practice and effort to be familiar with the nature of consciousness. As he notes, seeing or hearing something, the yogi realizes that the former occurs because of eye and color, or that the latter is due to ear and sound. In short, 
though the practice of mindfulness oh I'm sorry I think it's supposed to say through uh, in short through the practice of mindfulness the yogi becomes well aware of the cause and effect relationship between mind and body this is called Pachaya pari Parikana Jnana ok so that was a hard word so let's just see in short through the practice of mindfulness the yogi becomes well aware of the cause and effect relationship between mind and body so the relationship between mind and body is called Pacha Pachaya pari Pachaya Parikanyana in Pali. And so with that we're ending off here the next episode in the video series of the Aryavasa um, study, the talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. And for the next episode we're gonna be starting off with the next chapter which is inside knowledge of impermanence and so I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to listen and let's just thank Neo very much for joining us today that was very very cool thank you Neo and let me just as well get a chance to pay my respects to the triple the gem the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha and so, uh, Neil, let me just make sure you don't have any question or anything to add before I turn off the recording. Otherwise, I think we should just uh, finish off by uh, paying our respects to the Buddha again, as we did uh, in the beginning, and then I will end the video stream. So, okay. Seems fine. So let me just respects as well under the Bodhi tree here and uh, thank you and make sure to check up on the next video Sado Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputtasa and may you find true peace happiness and freedom from suffering thank you and thank you Neo